This video is best viewed on a stereoscopic 3D monitor or with YouTube's cardboard viewing option. For more 3D options, use the Flash Player by clicking the first link in the description. For the unwarped VR version of this video suited for viewing on a 2D screen or in a VR headset, click the second link in the description. Welcome to this mopping session at Laguna Seca. I was sent to mop this track, so I'm spinning out all over it. I can't believe I made that. Oh, I didn't make that. Tell me I cut the course. Tell me I tell me I cut the Oh, come on. Holy shit. Okay, no, 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 the car is fucked. Oh, come on. That was a pretty fucking good lap there. Here's one thing that I'll be able to do with the Indy car, the DW12, in iRacing that I was not able to do in P cars. Uh, with iRacing, we'll be able to do this. Check this out. I can even control it a little bit, you know? Like, decide where the next half donut will happen. Welcome to Stereo 3D Productions. Uh, if the last week of December 2015 was sort of dubbed Motorsports Week on this channel, turns out that the last month could sort of be dubbed Forced Motorsports Month. Uh, the reason being is that, well, obviously with the new headsets, all the simulators are getting updates on this channel. We've in the past visited iRacing, Project Cars, and Assetto Corsa, sort of in order of timeline, and obviously now that they're all progressively getting new support and new content, I sort of have to revisit everything. Uh, now, in my opinion, the three that I've mentioned would be sort of known as the big three, if you want. Uh, Project Cars, iRacing, Assetto Corsa, the ones you hear the most about in the PC simulation sphere. And, uh, well, I'm really surprised to see iRacing come out last. iRacing have finally released their CV1 support. And I'm really happy to feature it on this channel, finally, because, well, first off, it's been a while that the uh, runtime support was a little behind, so even when I was using the DK2, I was using the latest Oculus runtimes, so I was using Project Cars much more often than I racing lately, uh, because even though I use a runtime switcher, eventually you just end up dwelling on one runtime and doing a whole bunch of stuff on it, and there was Project Cars. So, I've had 
several months off the simulator. This happened to be the very first simulator I ever used in virtual reality. With the DK1, it was also the first simulator I used in virtual reality with the DK2. Uh, so every generation, this guy's been first, and now they're actually third. Even Assetto Corsa got their support in before. I'm not going to do too many comparisons to P-Cars because I strongly believe that each simulator, Assetto Corsa, P-Cars, and iRacing, each have their own exact purpose. Uh, iRacing is one of the most technical simulators. Uh, it lacks a few cool things, but it has a lot to offer for those who like to lap solo and those who like to race with others online in the context of a very regulated environment. Uh, now, P-Cars would be more of your picker-upper type simulator. You don't have the budget to support an iRacing subscription. You want something quick. You want something realistic. You get yourself P-Cars. It'll do the job fine. And Assetto Corsa appears to be between both universes. Now that I've returned to iRacing and that I have a fresh memory of all three, this is one of the first times that I use all three sims so close to each other. Like, I mean, days apart. And... I can tell you, uh, finally, like where I, I place each one, and I, I'm really putting a set of course between the two, sort of. Um, but the one thing that I was reminded of when I loaded this simulator is how so much less forgiving it is. So this is Watkins Glen, the full track with the open boot. I'm doing this for two reasons. This is going to be a good co performance comparison to Project Cars in terms of the driving. Now, I won't be doing any racing in this video. I'll try to keep a racing first impression separate, mostly because it's an online-only experience and involves using a specific type of car. I wanted to take the Indy car and go on Watkins Glen and do a bit of a comparison run, kind of like I did with Laguna Seca. Now, right off the bat, I got to tell you, this simulators visibility the fact that i can see all the way down to the tree line behind the farms over there i'm talking behind their fields i'm seeing the trees this is better than project cars i'll tell you why though this is almost cheating on the part of iRacing iRacing runs butter smooth and thus can afford to add msaa in their simulator i am not oversampling the resolution right now i'm not a pixel Density 2.0. This is just good MSAA being applied. I think it's at 8x right now. So there is almost no shimmering and no aliasing. And I'm getting what I've been describing a lot with driving simulations uh, with the Oculus Rift CV1. I think their lenses do driving simulations a gigantic favor. And it is especially obvious right now. This is like really hitting me in the face. Coming out of the pits here is the first time I see the track in the CV1. Those trees look real. Everything looks fucking real. Like the the view, wherever I look, looks fucking real. This dude, one thing I could compliment Project Cars over iRacing for is they definitely have cooler artists, I could say. These artists for iRacing are very technical. Whereas with Project Cars, they made things look good. Like they they glamorized it a little bit but i really do like the looks in iRacing whereas it looks real in terms of scale in terms of color and in terms of shapes of things it's really nice let's go out let's take her out for a drive let's see how i can do with this car let's at least keep it on the track would be a nice thing the force feedback is completely completely different than that of project cars completely different and i would say it is pretty superior to be honest with you um because when i went out on the oval earlier that bumpiness that i was feeling was unbelievably legitimate it was not it was not like an exaggerated result in the steering wheel. It, it Like, I've been on an oval track recently to the point where I drove to the point where I pretty much destroyed my tires completely. 
and I was rolling on my own marbles, and I can feel exactly the same kind of thing in this simo while I was out of, on the oval with this car earlier, I could actually feel myself drive on my own marbles. It's pretty fucking cool. This line that I just tried here came from Project Cars, actually. But I wasn't going very fast this lap, so let's... This is something I can't do here. Oh, oh my god. Ooh, that was limit. Alright, here we go. Oh, that shakiness is awesome. Holy shit. That's way off. That's way off. Let's see if I can improve that. I can do like 128 in project cars, I think. 126, I think. This is this is what I do in project cars. No shit. Obviously. Obviously, that's what I do in Project Cars. I, I downshift so late. There's no way this sim is gonna allow me to do that. And I don't mean the cutting the track bullshit. You saw the issues with that earlier in my uh, in my sort of tech run or B roll, if you want. If uh, Project Cars. Optimize a little enough so that you can have MSAA enabled, man, it would look this good. It would look exactly this good. I know you can super sample and go with the 2.0 pixel density, but that's like running twice the resolution. It's gonna slow the damn thing down. Whereas right now, this simulator. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at. Oh, shit. No, that didn't work. Shit, shit, shit. Fuck. Uh... This is the cleanest VR image I've seen to date. I think because it's the only thing I can run with so much MSAA on it. Also, thank you for preserving the stereoscopic image output eye racing. Love you for that. I love capturing my experiences in Stereo 3D. They left the mirror be in Stereo 3D. Doesn't seem to affect performance at all and people can record their experiences as seen in the headset originally. the track looks a little different I this could be a 90s rendition of the track I am not sure I recognize the guardrail color I've been there to see uh, NASCAR races 
twice. This is a pretty awesome show, and I recognize the guardrail colors. And it was in the 90s that it had gone, so... Camping and drinking beer and shit, that was really fucked up. We're young as fuck. Bunch of friends, we were like 18 and 19, and we all drove to Watkins Glen to watch the NASCAR weekend. It's really, really cool. IndyCar is returning to this track September 4th. Pretty stoked about that. It was one of the reasons why I took this track and put it in this video. Sort of celebrate the event. So that's sort of the technique I'm using in Project Cars now for that last segment of the track. Except it doesn't appear to be working out the same times at all. Not even close. I probably have to work on setup. I'm not geared correctly. I did not have a Watkins Glen setup. I took a medium downforce. I can't help but think this track could actually use the low downforce set up and give excellent results anyways. I was just thinking bumpiness there. Save it, save it, save it. Fuck, 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 fuck. I wonder if it's gonna ask me some bullshit like restart. Nope, it's at 8x right now and it's still running at 82 frames per second internally. The asynchronous time warp is probably taking care of the rest. Let's see. This is pretty impressive. Now, what I wanted to say about this, my point, was I started doing all my whole setup like this, and at some point in my mind, I'm sort of the mindset of using a screen. I'm sitting here doing all this, and I'm like, okay, well, I'll just turn... Wait a minute. I'm wearing... I'm, I'm at the track. I'm wearing the headset, right? What the fuck? Uh, and then I realized it is the first time, not the first time that I used these menus in VR. I have used these menus in VR even with the DK1, believe it or not. But it's the first time that it just felt so fucking casual, so normal, no forcing the eyes. I can even read the little fine prints. Uh, it's, it's really insane how this has gone leaps and freaking bounds. So what are we getting here? 81 still? I could probably go with that other level of MSAA then uh, if it's giving me 81. So it's probably, there's no difference. I can actually increase the fucking MSAA. Um, so here's the deal with this simulation experience. This is another one that runs amazingly. If I were to lower these just a little bit, all I have to do is lower these just a little bit, like remove a few things. I would start getting numbers in the hundreds here. This means that the software in multiple scenarios will not require a synchronous time warp to run at the headset's required frame rate. And thus, for those of you who have seen the Assetto Corsa video, I'm doing the same plea to the iRacing developers. iRacing, you guys are awesome. You've been with us since day one. DK1, DK2, CV1. This is my favorite simulation when it comes to driving realism and solo lapping. I wish it had AI. Uh, it's a feature that maybe one day will come along. It would become my number one go-to sim. I would no longer need any other simulation, in my, in my opinion, because it has the North American tracks I like, both road courses and oval. It has the North American cars I like, NASCAR, IndyCar, and it even has a few extras that are just nice to have, like the Formula One tracks, Montreal, Spa, and also there is a Formula One available for purchase if you want that. I am calling on you to implement Steam VR and support the HTC Vive iRacing. It is really, really important that you do this. Alike Assetto Corsa, you will be a blessing on the Steam VR community. I am not kidding. This will actually generate sales. Those who just get to try this thing for like a week. I think there's like a super small... Oh my god, the birds. I've never noticed the birds before. 
Are you fucking kidding me? They're in 3D. This is why I would say that this one is the best, but I can't say that because one, pricing model, kind of nifty to deal with, and two, no AI. Big, big, big downside. I think it's bigger of a downside than the subscription model, in my opinion. People would actually get around the subscription model is the AI would basically make this thing pay its own subscription for itself because it gets so many hours of use, especially in the case of someone like me. Uh, but the online racing, because you got to go through the licensing system, which I believe is a positive thing, by the way, the licensing system, but because you have to go through that, you have to go through a lot of cars that... I don't want to call them boring, but they're not the car you want to drive, you know? You want to get something more fantasy. And that's what I liked about Project Cars and Assetto Corsa is that there's a lot of fantasy arrangements you can make that you cannot do in iRacing. So I cannot say that this one is the best overall. But I can say that visually and driving-wise, it really is uh, the best. It, it, it's, it's just... That when I got out on the Fontana Oval and my steering wheel was just like, oh, fuck. I was like reminded of why I initially loved this simulator so much, despite the fact that it doesn't even have any AI. All right, before we get to any driving, I'm serious. Right now, I'm not even wearing the headset so I can concentrate for a few minutes uh, because I'm kind of excited about what we're going to do here. Uh, I got to address the three main grudges that I have with the Oculus Rift CB1. That being the head strap, the lenses, and the operating temperature. Now we can dismiss the lenses in the case of driving simulations. I think I've been clear about that in my Assetto Corsa and Project Cars videos where I find that the good that the lenses are bringing is very visible in driving simulations, whereas the downsides, such as the god rays and light artifacts, are not visible, almost not at all. So uh, it's a scenario where the CB1 sort of wins out right there, but there there remains the head strap and the operating temperature, and they sort of work hand in hand. Now, when it comes to the head strap, uh, I want to bring some advice to you people out there who might be sharing the same issues I have been having. This thing has to be worn much lower than the DK2. I think that a lot of people who used to own the DK2 will probably share the same problems I've had with the CV1. It's all, right off the bat, you probably heard me talk about this during the first impressions of this head that said that you have to wear it much lower than the DK2. I, I basically sat in Oculus Home just doing the kind of test I do in Vorpex, where I just sit, I lower it, I place it, and I look left and right to see if the FOV is correct. And the more I fiddled with it, the closer I got to something that was finally perfectly clear and much less warped when I move my head, this comes to actually my beef with the lenses where I find they're extremely intolerant to how you align the center of your eyes with the center of the lenses. The sweet spot is super tight. So if this thing is not on exactly as it's designed to be, you will have problems. So I've been improving that slightly. The problem I would still complain about is that there's a lot of readjustments needed during the play still. Operating temperature, great trick, which is, I'm probably not doing myself a favor right now by talking before the simulation with the thing on, but if you want to run cool, uh, it's pretty good with racing simulations, especially when you're doing solo runs, you'll go about half an hour at a time, right? Between your sessions, shut down your simulator and stop your Oculus service. Go in the Windows services and stop the Oculus runtime service. I have actually found that these electronics, when you're not running a game and you have Oculus Home off, these electronics remain on. The camera stays hot and the Oculus stays hot. If you stop the service, it'll cool down immediately. Hello, my love. Welcome to Indianapolis Motor Speedway, one of my favorite racetracks. And I would say this is my single favorite racetrack that I've never gone to, either as a fan or as a driver. Uh, there could be a lot of debate done about ovals and how they're easy or they're not easy. Uh, in my opinion, ovals have a very serious place in racing. Uh, they're an integral part of racing. What I like about IndyCar, personally, is that they really mix it up. 
you have the city tracks, you have the real traditional road courses, and you also have the ovals. They are not ignored, and the cars are configurable for all three scenarios. One of my favorite things about that league over Formula One, I would say, who really stick mostly to traditional road courses. Don't get me wrong, those road courses are tremendously difficult. So, at first what I can tell you is this, this freaking shit looks legit, man. It looks totally legit. And this is going to be pretty awesome because Indianapolis, or any oval track for that matter, but especially Indianapolis, my beef in terms of difficulty with these tracks is obviously not learning the track. It's 490 degree left turns. Most ovals are pretty much driven like this track, by the way. This is your super super basic core type oval track even the ovals that are curved on both ends you'll kind of take each end as two turns that's why they call them turns one two three and four on ovals that appear to only have two turns on them uh indy is a distinct four turn track it borderlines a little bit on the super simplistic road course uh what i love about indy is that you basically right out of the pits are already challenging the limits of the car itself most of the time the limit won't be you fighting the track but rather you fighting yourself and your car it will be your fear factor and your car's desire to hold on to the track at given speeds that will determine what you can do i know i'm taking a little time here before i get out on the track i have to make an announcement about aceto corsa I found a mod that has Indy. So it's not as good looking as this rendition, but it's pretty legit when it comes to the track itself. Now, I don't have this car in Assetto Corsa, but I used the Lotus Exos, uh, the same car I've been using in Monaco, to do a test run with other cars, and it was absolutely awesome. The AI of Assetto Corsa is actually excellent on oval. And I managed to learn how to draft for the first time in my life uh, with other cars on the track on a super speedway. Something I'd never done before. And I'm planning to do a video where I'm probably going to put together a sort of race uh, from end to end. I'm going to do 20 laps at Indianapolis, so 50 miles. I think we're going to have some fun with that. But now let's go do some miles at Indianapolis in iRacing. I got my Indy set up, so I should be good in those terms. But here's the thing, the forgiveness of this simulator, even over Assetto Corsa, because I've just driven, uh, like two days ago, a race in Assetto Corsa on, on this track. And because I was taking a car that's capped at 300 kilometers an hour, it was getting kind of easy to drive, to be honest with you. So to come back in iRacing, with the big league car now is going to be quite a difference. Got to get up to speed. I'm already up to speed, man. Holy shit. Holy fuck. Ovals are, and you know what? VR does so much fucking justice, especially with these improved visuals. I mentioned earlier that this would be a great test for visibility, what I was about to do next. These straightaways are seven-eighths of a mile long. And I can see all the way to the end of it. When I... Well, I'm going to come out of turn four now. Here. Coming out of turn four. Wow, those grandstands. I can see turn one. Fine. There's a little bit of shimmering on it, but nothing too bad. Like, I can see the wall, everything. It's amazing. And... The more clarity, the more detail, should I say. With the Rift, I find it's not necessarily clarity, it's smoothness over the Vive. Vive's forte is absolute clarity. Uh, with this image smoothness, this the visuals become so much more convincing that it actually enhances the sentiment of speed and sort of starts playing with your driver fear. That wall starts feeling like it's real. And right now, I've been driving with a car around this track in the Seto Corsa that's capped at 300 kilometers an hour. And this is feeling unbelievably fast in comparison 
I mean, I don't have the speed on the steering wheel or anything. I can probably look at the logs after or just run replays. It's probably in the 210s or so, maybe a little higher. Hopefully. What's my time? 41? 41 is shit. Yeah, I'm feeling that freaking incredible speed. And what Indy will do, what most ovals will do, especially when you're qualifying on them, it's the hardest thing to do. Indy in particular because of the qualifying model. You need to put together the best four laps of your life in qualifying. And technically, now you have four shots at it, or three. Um, but technically, you really only have one shot. When you're on the track, you don't want to waste your chance. If you have to come back, you fucked it up. Uh, most guys will qualify in one shot, and it is incredibly difficult to be asked to run those four laps back to back. You're not allowed to like take a, a break lap and, and try another one. It's session by session, and that's it. Look at that steering. I'm trying to just let it do that a little bit. So I'm not manhandling the car too much. You don't want to force the car on an oval to do something it doesn't want to do. You will spin out immediately when you do, you do that. That's the thing about a oval. It's such a different type of racing where you're sort of guiding the car rather than... Oh shit, I fucked that one up. Rather than commanding it you're more guiding it. Uh, and this is where it becomes so difficult in the context of racing. And this is why I'm so torn the fact that there's no AI in the simulator. Because it'd be so cool to get to practice the draft and practice this type of so unusual driving. I would qualify oval driving as unusual. The experience I had in the Seto Corsa, the very first one, was some of the sickest driving I've ever done in any simulation or real life, probably. I'll never get to do something that fucking insane in real life. And I wish I could use this simulator and its cars to do exactly the same thing, because I thought it was absolutely, completely batshit insane. And it got my heart racing, and, and imagine, though, that's what the cars that are capped at 300k. Can't even go faster than 300k. And I'm already, like, I, I got my heart racing. The thing is, is as you're trying to let your car do what it wants to do, you got other cars to deal with that are often next to you, and you sort of have to modify your driving line in order to accommodate for them, but without manhandling the car and spinning out. So it becomes a complete, absolute, total, entire clusterfuck. I also like the way Indy drives. It's a bit of a challenge thing where you gotta get close to the wall. Use as much track as you can. I'll give you an example here. I was kind of explaining this to my dad, who's also fascinated by this track's design. Look at the entry of turn one. It goes up, and this is where you do your downshift and sort of use that little uphill to come back downhill and gain a little speed. And you do the same thing with this turn. You have to sort of aim a foot-by-foot -foot section of pavement at each turn and not miss it. If you miss it, you're not necessarily going to spin out, but you will not be fast. you got to go hit that patch of pavement, and the lower you hit it, The more risk you take, but the faster you'll go. No, I really fucked that one up. I'm gonna use my fourth gear to catch up here. There we go. Uh, I almost spun out there unbelievably. See, I probably what I did right there is I didn't manhandle it to try to get back on the track. I let it do what it wanted to do. One of the best ways to get out of an accident situation on an oval is simply, a car wants to wiggle a bit, let it wiggle a bit. It's probably not going to take you out. If you try to stop it from wiggling, that's the point where you're probably just going to go. There we 
we go. No grass. Legit turn. That's a plus 44. Okay, so I, I need to get back up to speed. That's the other thing about ovals. We're talking short laps and high speeds. So if you're in the context of a race and you make a small, tiny, little mistake, you can end up dropping 10 spots. And not just that, in the process of dropping 10 spots, it's going to take you three to four laps to get back up to speed and back in the race's main pace. So any error, and I mean error, any error of any kind, is 10 times more costly on an oval. This is where, yes, you can say the surface is super simplistic. I agree with you. But the speeds are so high, the limits being tested are completely different. We're talking the car's engine is being tested to its maximum, its grip is being tested to the maximum, and your nerves, your, your fear is being tested to the maximum at all times. One of the big advantages I notice of the CV1 over the DK2 is not even necessarily pixel density. It's the brightness and the pixel pattern. Uh, the brightness of these pixels makes it that the, else, the, the space between them is sort of lit and thus you notice the gap between pixels way less than you do with the DK2. Um, so not only does it have 10% more pixel density, if you take a calculator and you do the math, not only do the lenses give you more of that screen in your eyes, thus further increasing pixel density, but on top of that, the pixel pattern and their brightness seems to be doing a big, big deal of a favor to things like driving simulations. Because now it's like, it's just so good looking in here unbelievably good and real looking. I would say though that so far out of the three tracks I tried, the one when I was that had the most impressive scenery was uh, Laguna Seca. Very impressive scenery. Field of view is absolutely amazing in the CV1 for driving simulation see yeah, in the corner of your eyes. I've been using it for a while doing these videos and it's starting to get pretty hot in here starting to make me sweat just by the headset. People have been leaving comments on my temperature test video. A lot of people are mostly like, uh, there, there's two types of comments. Some people agree, some people disagree politely and just say like, in my case, I don't seem to be affected by this. Uh, but evidently, what the test is revealing only, like maybe not by temperature number exactly, let's not take the thermometer's word for the exact temperature, but let's take its word for the difference. It does indicate a difference between Vive an oculus and i seem to be much more affected than others by it i would say that anyone who's owned a dk2 in the past and i used the dk2 for long duration for long durations of time uh without stopping would probably be in the camp that would easily agree with me because it's it's slightly a jarring difference that's the biggest thing, comparatively speaking. If this is your first headset, you'll probably make no big about it and think that it's going great, right? But for those of you who've had a DK2, you're, you're feeling the difference for sure. For sure, for sure. Uh, and tell you what, if you took a simulator setup, you know, those of you who say it doesn't affect you, if you took a simulator setup, kind of like mine, and ran iRacing race, I right now on this track, the way I'm running it with the force feedback settings, and you're not breaking a freaking sweat, or at least your body, your arms, and your head aren't getting hot, you're doing it wrong, man. You're not driving hard enough. That cannot be. And this is where I find it gets the worst. You're obviously combining physical effort with uh, the uh, heat of the headset. Heat from physical effort combined with heat from the physical headset equals more heat, and thus, some sweat. So, I already tend to sweat when I do driving simulations, and this is sort of a mutual effect that the headset produces. And to anyone who races really hard in driving simulations with good deals of force feedback, especially in this one that has a brutal force feedback. It's kind of like trying to hold a bull steady by the horns. It's really, really nasty. Compared to like even Project Cars, this force feedback hurts. It is, it is really cool. Uh, 
it, it, like it, you gotta be getting hot at some point and breaking a sweat. As there's no avoiding it in the first place. So th th then that's where you're probably gonna say, yeah, the headset isn't helping. Now, in the case of a seated VR experience, maybe heat applies less for some. But like I said. I'm a DK2 guy, I was used to a certain temperature level, and the HTC Vive is exactly in that ballpark, whereas the CV1 is hotter, and I can freaking feel the difference. And I much prefer have those 10 degrees less when I'm running with the Vive. So that's why I personally opted for the Vive. Um, but it's funny, right now, as I say this, a trickle of sweat is starting to come off the left side of my nose. Um, so yeah no this 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 headset really does contribute to the sweat factor my object with that video was to determine god damn it it's it's actually really running hotter than the vive to what degree i actually wanted to see like at what level are we talking about um something i really like about iRacing is the pits the Assetto Corsa, I go in the pits, I do exactly what I just did here, I break, the guy doesn't bring the fucking sign out, I don't know what key to press, I'm gonna try to figure it out, but why didn't it just fucking work this way, I didn't even need to press any button right now, I just stopped, put in neutral at the right place, and they did their thing, that's how it should always work, like, yeah, I really like that part, I fucking so wish this sim had... AI, it would be such an uh, an easy decision for me to recommend it to you as your main simulator. If you have the money to spend on it, obviously. There we go. Oh shit. Holy fuck. Oh fuck, grass. Shit. Ah, uh, sabotaged my lap. And almost hit the wall. Fucking ovals will do that to you. They'll make you defy yourself, and eventually you'll over-defy yourself. That's the thing about ovals, that last thing I sort of forgot to mention. Man, will they make you pay the price in real life for a bad mistake. See that cement wall? They're safer barriers now on most ovals, but even with a safer barrier, you will rattle when you hit the wall on an oval for real. Oh shit, speaking of fuck, oh. That would have given me whiplash. Oh yeah, don't, look. I was talking about a car that wants to turn left. Now it only wants to turn left. Probably A 44 on my cool down lap, which is now the car is completely fucked. I'm going to call it a session now. Um, Oculus Rift had about an hour and a half. With, uh, I would say the first session actually lasted 45 minutes and there was a cool down period between um, the first session and the second pair of sessions. Um, and that helped out a lot. So those of you who use Oculus, don't only close Oculus Home when you finish your session. Uh, go and kill the runtime service completely in your administrative tools and re-enable it before you start a VR experience, of course. That will cause your headset to turn off without the need to disconnect it, which is kind of annoying. And then it's going to get to cool down between sessions to, like, room temperature. And then at least you start off with a good 20 degrees less. I'm not kidding. This thing, its main problem right now is not just that it runs hot, but that it starts off hot. Uh, that, and by the way, I do have to say something about defogging. I don't believe that this degree of temperature is intended for defog. There's no way in hell. I think personally that it's the overclocked screens that are a benefit to all of us, but also the way it's designed. It's, the screens are much closer to your eyes than in the Vive. I think they worked that out a little better in the Vive in terms of distance, uh, which is why that sensor was just nowhere near picking up that kind of temperature compared to the CV-1. This is birds again. All right, folks, thanks for watching. This has been absolutely awesome, and I'll look into getting some racing done, stick time with some racing in the simulator, but uh, right now, my next plan is, uh, I got a few videos planned, but one in terms of racing will be something I wanna do with Assetto Corsa and Indianapolis. I've been wanting to do that in some form or another for a long time.
So I shall see you next time, folks. Thanks for watching Forced Motorsports Month at Stereo 3D Productions.